Glad to have you, Dr. Budalia. Thank you so much for coming out. So thank you for inviting me onto the podcast. Really excited to chat to you. Of course. And this is um, the first time we're having someone on the podcast that is not based in the US. So it's very, uh, it's a very interesting time right now. And especially with your set of experiences that you've had, it's, yeah. I think, going to be an awesome conversation. Yeah, I mean, healthcare is universal. So it's amazing to be able to share, I guess, experiences that I've had and um, see where the difference is like from what you're exposed to, where you are in the US at the moment as well. So yeah, it's right. brilliant to kind of have that transcontinental conversation. <laughs> it really is just through Zoom. I love it. Um, but kind of just to start things out, um, what was your, I guess, journey through medicine? Um, and, you know, how'd you get started? And I know like in the in 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 Britain, you have like a little bit of a different system too. Yeah. So how how would that work? I mean, through school, I always knew I wanted to do medicine. Um, it was just what I always wanted to do. There was no other option for me. I just didn't want anything else. Um, right. I guess with voluntary work, work experience, also having doctors in the family kind of subconsciously pushed me in that direction. But honestly, looking back now, it was definitely the right decision. Um, in terms of the journey, at 18, we, or 17, 18, we applied to university and we do an undergraduate course in medicine. Right. Although there is the option to do it as a postgraduate if you choose to do that later on. I went in through sort of our usual route, which is uh, um, through the undergraduate route at 18, um, doing a five-year course. Um, I went to the University of Birmingham, which is based sort of centrally, if you look at the UK on the map, um, in the Midlands. And um, yeah, five-year degree. Um, but I also did something what, what we call an intercalation. It's where we get a, a full BSc degree in one year by studying another degree elsewhere. So I went to another university and I did sports oh. and exercise science for, for one year. So by the time I'd finished med school, I'd come out with um, a medical degree, but also a BSc, so Bachelor of Science in Sports Science as well. So it was a six year journey for me. Um, and in, in, in the final year of medical school, we apply for jobs. So I think this is where there's a bit of difference from what we do and you guys do. Because I've got a friend in the US and we're, we're comparing notes. Um, for us, what we do is we embark on like a two year kind of training program. They call it the foundation program where um, you apply for a set of jobs and you're rotating through specialties every four months. Hmm. And um, I did four months in, I guess, in the ER. So our emergency department, four months of that, then respiratory medicine um, and then COVID hit. So then I kind of got held in the respiratory ward. And then more recently, I've been doing what we call renal medicine. And now I'm doing trauma and orthopedics. So at the moment, I'm in my second year of being a doctor. Yeah, and I'm 26 okay. now, as of yesterday. So um, yeah. Oh, happy late birthday. So Thank you. Thanks. That, that's awesome. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a cool system. So you so you cycle in. I think it's similar to like our fourth year like rotations, I guess. Um, yeah. But I guess you, you're actually working in it and, and I think doing a lot more with But that. we do rotations in med school as well. Oh, so, okay. So gotcha. like from our third to our fifth year, it's all clinical. Like we're on mm -hmm. the wards shadowing doctors, but on the ground, like as the doctors on the wards, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So, so you got held up in the respiratory ward during COVID. Yeah. So how was that? <laughs> it was, uh, it was crazy actually. Um, it was my second what we call rotation. So I was probably, I, I, so COVID hit around February, March time. And I was due right. to move on to my last rotation of that year in August, not August, in April time. Um, so what they did is they held us on the respiratory ward when COVID started happening, they redeployed doctors. So doctors coming in from what we call the community. So from GP, from psychiatry placements, um, from placements where they, they're not essential to be their supernumerary. And they all came and flooded the wards. But they kept me on respiratory medicine because I guess they realized that we had exposure to respiratory problems. So they thought, let's keep them there. And to be honest, to begin with, it was unpredictable. Um, at the very early stages, we kind of didn't really take it seriously because it hadn't affected us in the UK. We'd heard about it in China, we'd heard about it in Italy, and we thought, you know what, We're, we've got a great support system here. There's no chance that any government or any system would allow a virus to take full control of the country like it has, which is right. absolutely mad. Um, but to begin with, we kind of 
didn't think too hard about it. But as it started to infiltrate the UK, we started to feel more fe fearful. And it was when my, my consultants became fearful, that's when we became fearful, our spiritual consultants of all people, they're starting to teach us how to do things like um, um, just, just kind of airway management and things that we shouldn't really be doing so much, like um, managing tracheostomies and things that aren't really a respiratory thing. It's more what you guys call otolaryngology, I think. We call it ENT, ears, ears nose, and throat. So we're trying to, we, had, we had so much new training and it was the unpredictability, the uncertainty, um, and having patients coming in with COVID actually dying as well. We were like, whoa, this is, this is a bit scary now. And that's kind of where it all kicked off. Right. And so this is, this is a really interesting time because this is when, you know, you were talking about all that panic and like the, the stress and the feelings that you had when this brand new thing happened. And I guess as time went on, that just compounded, you know, and as patients increased, it got even worse. Yeah. And then you did something, you did something amazing. You, you use one of your hobbies um, to try to help the sentiment of people, right? Like the people that are, that you're working along with um, NHS sessions. So, um, or NH sessions, sorry. Um, so tell me about that day, right? Tell me about the day where, you know, you're, you're coming home from work or mm -hmm. from your time at the hospital and you decided to do this. You thought that this is something that would give um, a lot of benefit to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I didn't actually realize the benefit it would give people. Um, music has been a huge passion of mine for years since I was a child. For university, I, I DJed for fun for my friends, clubs and festivals. Yeah. And uh, I mean, one year I won a contest to play at a festival called Tomorrowland, which pretty much changed my life overnight from, from like a DJ perspective. But really, the music stuff had really calmed down in my life because I've started to work as a doctor. So then when lockdown happened here in the UK, I was living alone and I felt like I needed something to look forward to every evening. I didn't really know what to do. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to set up my decks on my kitchen counter and do a DJ set. And I thought, you know what, let's wear a scrub top as well, see what happens. But it actually took a few days, probably a couple of weeks for it actually to happen. Because I thought, this is a crazy idea. Like, why am I going to do this? People are going to look at this like, what is this guy doing? Like, <laughs> I actually cared what people thought. Um, but then I, I, I came up in my mind, the idea of NH sessions. I thought NHS for sessions, it sounds quite cool. I can make a logo. I can get my friends who I've, who I've got to know through the music industry to get involved. They can do performances as well. And make it an actual place for people to enjoy music, to feel good. Um, so that moment you asked me about just now, actually what happened was I was walking outside um, and... I was voice noting one of my one of my good friends. I said, I've had this idea. I'm gonna call it N8 sessions. I'm gonna DJ on my scrubs. I thought, it feels like a weird idea, but what do you think? He goes, brilliant, do it. You have to do this. He goes, this is the best idea you've ever had. And um, I thought, okay, let's just do it. He gave me that confidence. Um, so I did it. I recorded a DJ set in my scrubs in my kitchen after a night shift, making breakfast. I recorded a couple actually. And I, I also asked a few friends to record DJ sets and performances. And pretty much overnight, it took off. I had bigger artists reaching out to me. I had celebrities endorsing it. Um, like one, one celebrity in the UK, um, he posted a video on his Instagram and it got like 150,000 views overnight. Oh my gosh. Um, I had this guy, celebrities messaging me, giving me their numbers, saying, what's at me? I want to make this bigger. I thought this is just like an idea in my brain, like a vision in my brain. And actually... Um, I've it has so much potential to make people feel good. Um, really, at the core of it, what I wanted to do was to lift spirits of everyone who's stuck at home in isolation or in lockdown, but also to celebrate the hard work of frontline workers. And the initial idea came from wanting to make my friends who I work with, who are my age, I, I literally, they're my best friends, and going through the most difficult times. Like, one of my colleagues had a breakdown on the ward because she had to break bad news to six families in one go about COVID. And um, it was for these people I wanted to do it. And the fact that it just reached millions. Right. That, that's just insane to see. Like, it's only been, you know, a couple months since you've started it, right? And it's already, you know, yeah. internationally renowned. People are listening to it all over the, the world, like you said. Yeah. And 
music really is that, right? Like, like for me personally, music is always that thing that I go to when I'm feeling like stressed out or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of it and I just need to relax yeah. for a little bit. And I think that's, that's exactly what you're saying, right? With yeah. the um, music it's, in your there's life. There's no thinking involved with music. There's no thinking involved at all. You just listen and enjoy, you know. And if you can see a doctor dancing around in scrubs, looking like a, a, bit, a bit weird, you know, it's more, more entertaining. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And it, it really is because like I, I, I've watched a couple of yours and the, the energy that you have in them too is like, you know, it's not like you, it doesn't look like you just came back from work. It's like, you know, this is giving you more energy as you're performing. Yeah, Which, there's something special about it. It's the feeling of, of, um, of togetherness, you know, it brings people together through music. But also, it's completely changed my perspective of social media. So for example, on New Year's Eve, um, a few days ago, um, I had three live streams planned. I, I planned them myself. I reached out to people and said, look, I want to do them off your pages so we can get a big, big reach. But I was working 8 a.m. till half eight all week. And I was knackered on this last night. Got back and I had a few technical issues. I thought, oh, I don't want to do this. I can't bother to do this. I sorted the technical issues out. I went live. Before I knew it, I'd forgotten about being tired from work. You know, All I saw was 600 people tuned in continuously throughout a live stream for an hour constant comments saying that they appreciate the work of doctors, frontline workers, nurses, domestic staff, security, everyone who works in the front line. And yeah, it's that feel of to get, feeling, of, feeling of togetherness and um, the power of music that, you know, just goes so far. Yeah, it brings everyone together. It's just, that, that's, that's a really interesting story though, like is seeing that, you know, there are other people in the same situation as you that have come home from work after, you know, being away or being at work that whole day. And then they come home and they're able to listen to your show and, you know, mirror that same energy that you've had. And it's it, like, like you said, it's energizing. You need, everyone needs something refreshing and you know, something to look forward to. And I want to be able to provide that for people. And uh, as much as it's helping other people, it's helping me, you know. Um, it keeps your mind occupied. It gives you something to look forward to at the end of a day that's been stressful. And I think it's healthy to have that balance in your life. Whether you're doing something like this to this level where it's occupying all of your time or whether you're just going for a run, you know, you've got to have something else. Right. And how do you think that, um, you know, getting involved with this has changed your um, job working as a doctor? It's a very, very interesting question, actually. I think it's um, changed it in a lot of ways. It's changed my life in a lot of ways, really, because I started this in April and people come to hear of it in waves. I don't know what, what happens. It goes viral on Instagram or on Facebook or a video reaches a lot of people and then it comes in waves. Um, the way it's changed my perspective is that it, in a few ways, actually. First of all, I think it's given everyone, including those who work within the healthcare systems, a greater appreciation of the system as a whole, you know? how robust we are and actually how well we do work together despite being in constant pressures. Like we're still afloat. We're struggling, but we're still afloat. You know, that's the first thing. That's one perspective of mine has changed. But also there is music in, in medicine as well. I mean, someone reached out to me from out of the blue saying, um, I've just come out of ITU. I was on a ventilator and um, I've been using your music to get me through my rehab. And I thought wow. this is exactly why I'm doing it. Um, I think it can be, I think it can be really, really powerful in motivating people. And like you said, it takes no energy to listen to music. It's just something you do. So right. I feel like that's probably another aspect. Um, but I think it, balancing two things has stretched me as a person. Like it's been quite tough on myself, like physically at times. Um, so as a person, it's helped me to grow. And I think in a career in medicine going forward in the future, I'll be able to deal with greater, greater pressures and things, you know. Um, right. I'm still learning. I'm still learning what the benefits of it are. But the real benefit, I think, is the impact of people universally. Yeah. And like you said, do, like music is medicine, you know, and it, it is like that. That's a really interesting story to hear, like the, the fact that someone, you know, was on a ventilator getting that treatment and then using your music as kind of like an emotional treatment which is, yeah. I think, a really big long-term effect of COVID that we're not going to see right now, but it's going to become evident pretty soon. I, yeah, and I, I, I really couldn't believe that it was actually reaching people in these places. Like on, on social media, 
follower numbers or viewer numbers are just a number. Right. It's like who actually is receiving this and who actually is benefiting from it. And that was one example where I realized it's actually making a real world impact. Right. And have you had like multiple of, you know, you know, patients coming up to you or people that you're working with talk to you about um, NH sessions? Like, you know, people that you'd never told about your your venture and they kind of just discovered it and like, oh, I, I didn't know you're doing this. I mean, I don't really tell anyone about it because um, I'm either working on the ward or I take myself off into like a doctor's office in a break or something I'm on my laptop scheduling the next video or planning my next one or, or even just replying to people who have sent me kind messages. Um, yeah, you're completely right. I've had people who are my colleagues say to me, I've just saw you on the internet or whatever. And once I was in a doctor's office and a girl went on TikTok and she goes, this is you, just come up on my uh, FYP for you page on TikTok. Right. I thought, can't believe it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's been, it's been mad, really. Yeah. Yeah. And when you talk about how it stretched you as a person, has it has it been hard to to balance the two? Definitely. Yeah. I was working flat out on it. Um, the, the advantage to begin with was when COVID happened, they, they moved rotors around for us. So they made our days longer from eight, nine hour days to 12 hour days. Uh, but they gave us more time off in between. Mm. So having more time off in between, when I could focus on this, when I a stretch of three days off, it was a good use of my time. But as it built up and up and up, the momentum just kept going. And I felt like I had to deliver as well, deliver what people wanted. Um, so yeah, it definitely stretched me physically. Um, I was working around the clock very, very late, um, to the point where I was probably like, neglecting myself quite a bit. Like I wasn't eating very well. I stopped going for walks or runs, stopped exercising purely because I was so addicted to this journey and just the impact it's having on other people. I didn't put myself first. Um, but towards the first lockdown in the UK, we had one lockdown that came to an end sort of late summer around July, August time, mm -hmm. I, I took a step back and I thought now it's time for me. I'm going to start seeing my friends in real life. Um, and I kind of managed to rebalance it in my mind as to where I want it to go and um, took a more kind of um, uh, what's the word? strategic approach to it rather than throwing everything at it. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, you've achieved this much success in such a short amount of time. I'm curious to know, like, what do you plan for the future of NH Sessions? And, you know, that, that can be up in the air. Like, you you don't need to have a plan or anything. But do you have any particular goals or anything for this really amazing project? Yeah, no one's really asked me that in terms of NH Sessions. They always ask me like, for myself personally. But I like the way you put it. Purely because I love the fact that NH Sessions, actually, I want it to encompass a lot. It's more than just me DJing. It's also... Um, friends and artists who I believe are talented and I want to give them a platform to show their music in this very specific niche. We've got, we've got specific people watching this who love the NHS and they love music. It's a huge audience we have in the UK and around the world. So I want it to be a, a platform for new, for new music and new artists, whether that's them performing it themselves with the NH Sessions title next to their name or whether it's me playing their music as part of a DJ set. I also want it to represent um, important causes that I believe in. So for example, in the UK, um, I, N8 Sessions and my story was used to um, promote a national sport and health campaign for the government. So we have a, a body called Sport England and Sport England, the government funded and um, the government launched a body of like, workouts and exercises on their website for people at home to do to keep fit and healthy. So my, my story's N8 Sessions was put on TV, I was interviewed, and they used that as a way of getting Sport England's campaign recognized on national, on network TV around the world, and I was the one talking about it. So I want N8 wow. Sessions to be a way of pushing important causes and campaigns to brand collaborations that I believe in, ways of supporting mental health. Um, dance music is so important to me as well, and there's a big rise in awareness of mental health and dance music with the passing of people like Avicii, for example. So I've been getting involved in sort of dance music conferences, talking about mental health. That's another thing that I wanted to encompass. Um, on a more sort of personal level, I, um, I'm actually, I've got a lot of music ready. And we're speaking to some, some top record labels at the moment about releasing the music. So right. that's something I'm really excited for in the next 12 months. 
Wow, that's that's so much. I mean, that that's amazing. I, I just it's really amazing to see, you know, how much you can do with something that just started with a text to your friend. I know. Yeah. And I think the one thing I believe is if you have an idea, just do it and start now. Don't over plan, don't overthink it, just get the ball rolling. Otherwise you'll never right. start. Right. Cause I think like sometimes we do too much research on things, right? You're like, oh, is that really, is that really gonna be a good idea? Would people actually care? Yeah. But it doesn't work. Yeah. You learn on the job. I think you learn whilst you're doing it. Right. Yeah. Kind of how um COVID has been getting worse, right? And you've you've been definitely seeing that as working in the front lines. Yeah. How how has that been, you know, aside from music and how has it been like and how has it taken a toll on like your your personal health and stuff? Because you know that stuff is that like that you you said the mental health aspect is is very important as well. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question to answer really because um, I feel the the way the media portrays things, especially here in the UK, isn't representative of actually what us as frontline doctors are going through on a daily basis for two reasons. Some days are terrible, some days are fine. Um, and this usually coincides with lockdowns being lifted and the time for the virus to spread in the communities, that kind of thing. But also, the images that are shown on TV tend to be of patients who are stable. They're you know, on a ventilator in ITU. They don't look acutely unwell. Um, they don't show, though, the patients coming through the front door in the emergency department, breathless, gasping for breath, who are on the, basically on death's door. They look like it. So that's the thing, the media don't... Now, from my experience, what I, what I felt was when things started, it was the uncertainty and unpredictability that got me the most, the anxiety, the fear, and the unknown of the virus. Um, because we would have patients who were, were breathless or on oxygen, but we didn't know how they're going to be 12 hours later. Or they would be swabbed as positive, or maybe half a litre of oxygen, but then six hours later, they're suddenly requiring 15 litres of high flow oxygen out of nowhere, suddenly they just deteriorate. And we're talking, yep, 85 year old, 90 year old, males, males and females, but occasionally even 30 year olds, 40 year olds going on the respiratory wards. And it was that fear that kind of took a toll on us. Um, the thing that makes it most difficult is really the volume of the heartbreak, I think, mm -hmm. um, the volume of it, um, seeing my colleagues suffer as well. Um, having to break bad news to families is, is probably one of the hardest things I have to do. I mean, right. Cause the families can't even be with the patient or yeah. they can't even see them. That's the hardest thing. Like my, uh, my, one of my good friends from work, she was a year above me. She was like my role model still is really. And, um, when COVID happened, she was the first person to take the bay of patients on the ward with six confirmed cases of COVID all elderly ladies. And she had to phone up all the families and say, your grandma, your mom, your sister has COVID. The prognosis is poor. They're deteriorating and you can't come and see them. And she had to do that for six patients. And, um, and this is how this was happening to people who are rock solid. Like you would not expect them to break under any pressure. Um, and this is happening quite, quite frequently, actually. So we've all had those experiences. I, I had patients who contracted COVID in hospital. They're medically fit to go home. We were just waiting for them to, you know, get their carers in place or something social to get them, to get them back home again. Then they would contract COVID in hospital or they'd become a contact and then they would deteriorate and then die. And those are some of the hardest ones. Um, I had a lady with MS actually, who um, was fit to go home, completely fit. But they kept her in hospital because one of the ladies in her bay had tested as positive. Three, four days later, she developed a, a slight chestiness and a cough. Oh. The following week, she was unconscious and in a side room on high flow oxygen. And th that broke my heart because I was the one telling her before, we're going to get you home, we're going to get you home. Not long now. Um, she, and she was like, I need to get home because she has MS and she struggles to breathe. If she gets COVID, it's going to be difficult. Um, and it was just the, the whole situation was, was, was tough. And that times, I guess, times 30, when you have that many patients on, on our wards times, 
I don't know, 10 months now or so. Um, it's quite a lot, really. Yeah, in your first year or your, yeah, yeah first, first year. First year, yeah. So it's the it's teamwork. And we have, a, we have an amazing team of doctors who are your friends, you know, and we, we unwind quite well together. You know, we, right. we, we work hard and we, we, I guess we play hard as well, we socialize hard. So we need to do it, you know, to keep our minds healthy. Exactly. And how, how has the pandemic, you know, dealing with all of this, all of these cases changed your relationship with the field of medicine? You know, like you said, you always wanted to be a doctor, but has working through a pandemic and, and saving, you know, countless lives, um, but also having to deal with countless lives lost, has that kind of, I guess, strengthened your calling to medicine or has it, you know, changed it at all or how has that affect yeah i, I mean it's, i feel like it's all of it i've ever known because it's pretty much all i've ever known whilst i've been working as a doctor but if anything it strengthened my love of medicine and the reasons why i want to become a doctor um I, I truly believe as a doctor you really do have a unique set of skills that have been ingrained into you throughout medical school but also the reason you become a doctor is because you have certain personality traits or characteristics that would align with helping people and if during these times where people are suffering at, 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 the, at, at most there's so much they're suffering those in hospital but also the family members it um, makes you realize why you do this job and actually if you can't help them or if your seniors can't help them then really no one can so you have this sense of responsibility to make them better and actually you, we, you do make people better. You lose some as well, but you, you're doing everything you can. You're giving them the best end to their life, if that is possible, by making them comfortable and um, being that person there for them. Like, I feel privileged to be able to be that person there like with them, holding their hand whilst they're dying or something like that, um, rather than them being home, suffering with the virus, dying alone. There's just so many ways of viewing it, you know, but I think it strengthened my love of medicine as a whole. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's weird to say this, but like the, the practice right now in your first year will make, I feel like the rest of your journey like easier in a way because of how much you've seen in such a short amount of time. Yeah. We, we, it's a lot of acute stresses, a lot of shifting, a lot of unknown, as I keep saying, um, but I think these are skills that you're going to, you're going to take away forever. I mean, I do love acute medicine. I don't want to work in acute medicine later on. I love the emergency department. I love when things come in, um, um, quite, quite intense moments, having to assess uh, deteriorating patients. I find the adrenaline quite good and the fact that you can bring them around quite quickly, so rewarding. Um, so it gives you a sense of confidence that when things hopefully do go back to normal, we will have learned from this and we've actually improved as doctors mm. because we've been forced to become more compassionate and to deal with situations in a shorter space of time. Right. And thank you. Thank you so much for that. Like it's, it's, it's really eye opening to hear from doctors like you to see that, you know, this is still, this is still happening, right? This is, this isn't just something that happened back in March or, or April and it's, it's still as bad or worse than it was before. Um, if you had to say, what, what do you think is your favorite story from your time practicing in, in medicine? Like favorite experience or anything? Really good question. As a whole, um, I think if I, as like a general answer, my favorite part of the job experience as a whole is the sense of teamwork and being able to work with people who you consider friends. On the ward, you're professional. We were always professional, but on the ward, you're professional dealing with a patient who's deteriorating and everything just fits into place. I'm talking doctors to doctors, doctors to nurses, um, anyone who's involved in the care of a patient, it just clicks and it happens. And it's the fact that we can rely on each other. We each have each other's back. Um, but then off the ward, in a more social setting or when we're in the doctor's office, we can completely unwind and just chill out and just be normal humans you know just normal i guess 25 year old 26 year old um young doctors junior doctors who have just come out of university just be ourselves 
and I think it's that appreciation of being able to kind of do both that I, I really, really enjoy. And it's the teamwork and the, the atmosphere of working with people who just, are just good to be around. That's what's got me through the last few months. I mean, that's right. what I love most about the job. Gotcha. Yeah. And I guess it really is a team sport, you know, everyone yeah. working together. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, just before we close out, I just want to ask you uh, one more thing, but what is something that you wish people knew about your job that is not well known? I think if people could see the emotional challenges that we face, that would be very eye opening. I've been thinking this actually the last few weeks when I mentioned to you just now about how the media don't necessarily portray everything. They show snapshots. I feel like if they had an insight into how actually doctors feel, like for example, my colleagues who, who broke into tears when they had to break that bad news. Um, or for example, when I call my mum after I've had to certify a patient's death, uh, a patient who I was trying to save and they, they passed away from COVID. It's those moments that I don't really feel people really are aware of because they're not in that environment. So if people could have one, one, one sort of insight, it would be that to maybe, maybe just to speak to a doctor, trying to understand what it is on an, on an emotional level or a frontline worker, what they're going through, what have been the hardest times. Things that like I know you or I or my colleagues or my friends who I work with have been through, but I know for a fact that my neighbor who has no medical um, family members or they're not medically trained in any way would not really know. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, and I think that's something I think that is kind of overlooked, right? Like, especially with the number um, of cases that we're seeing, right? People are so fixated on those numbers that yeah. it's hard to focus on or, or think about the emotions behind those. You know, like I think if, like you said, there was more, of that in media, you know, seeing doctors actually talking about what they just saw, doctors talking about, you know, like you said, the six patients they just had to break terrible news to, you yeah. know, things, things like that are what people need to hear in order to really take this thing seriously. And it's also about showing it as well. So we have, we have a program in the UK called Casualty, and it's where we have, where it's based in an emergency department in the UK. And just the other day, they released an episode that was showing what it's like for those working in the emergency department dealing with COVID. And I thought it was a fantastic representation of the emotional impact because it was basically a consultant and her colleague reflecting and a tearful reflecting on the challenges that they've been facing. And they, they showed, they kind of showed the, the images of it happening. But even with that, the one part they missed was how stretched we are. So even though everyone's emotional and, we, and it's unpredictable, they're showing five, six team members around a patient. But actually, in reality, it's one or two team members for four or five patients stretched. So how do you show that? How does the media con convey that? I don't know how. Um, but if somehow people could have that insight, they would understand what we're going through. And actually, it's a real problem that we're facing. Right. That... Gosh, but it's just it's just such a concerning thing. Like, I feel like it, it it would be with with especially with media's power. Like, it would be easy to do, like it wouldn't be too difficult. I think, right? You know, you go into hospitals yeah. and. But then it's how do you show a patient deteriorating? You can't film that. Yeah, yeah, you can't record. Yeah, can't, that's the thing. You can't film. The doctor wouldn't want you filming them stress between two patients or running between three wards in an evening when there's no cover to deal with a patient who, like an old lady who's just had a fall, another one who's now needing oxygen um, yeah. between two separate wards. It's just, I don't know how people, it'd be amazing if they yeah. could show this in some way. It really is. And I think like, like, like that emotional aspect, like if you know someone who you, if you've lost someone to COVID, right? I feel like yeah. you take COVID more seriously than your average person, well, like as like a baseline, because yeah. you've seen it firsthand and you felt the emotions firsthand. And for a lot of people, those emotions don't really occur because it, like you said, it didn't affect them personally. You have to have the experience to be able to, you know, feel those emotions. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bodalia. Really appreciate thank your you time today. Me. No, really yeah. good questions and really, really nice chatting to you. You too. Do you have anything else to close out or? No, just just thank you for having me. And um, hopefully once 
the pandemic's over, we can actually go back to clubs and festivals and enjoy music in real life. <laughs> yeah, and I'm excited real to see life. where where you go and where NH Sessions goes um, as well. I think I think we're going to see a lot um, of really amazing things this next year. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for doing such a great job with the podcast. Of course, thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation and thank you so much for listening. If you love Metspectives, be sure to follow us on Spotify, drop us a review on Apple Podcasts and share this podcast with your friends. It really helps us grow and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much and I'll see you next Monday. Thank you.